Thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to present today. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides. And yes, we can. We can. We'll get started. So um, again, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've enjoyed the meeting to this point and certainly uh, lots of important information uh, for a group like my own as we think about how to really uh, increase the rigor and the refinement of our animal studies, uh, which, uh, as the introduction indicated, is really focused on understanding uh, the pathogenesis of infectious diseases. So today I'm going to talk about uh, work that my group has been doing using the collaborative cross mouse genetic reference population to really understand the impact of host genetics on susceptibility to a wide variety of, of viral pathogens. Uh, my goal is really to introduce everybody to, to the resource, uh, provide some examples of how we've used it uh, to study infectious diseases, and hopefully provide you with some new insights into some mechanisms uh, driving either virus-induced path path pathology or protection from disease. Uh, it's important to point out all of this work involves collaborations between multiple laboratories. Some of the key collaborations involve a long-term collaboration with Drs. Ralph Barrick, Fernando Partimano of Vienna, uh, Martin Ferris, and Victoria Baxter, who are all faculty members at the University of North Carolina. Um, everything I'm showing today involves collaborations with their groups. Uh, I'll point out uh, work from uh, specific individuals as we go, but I wanna note uh, some key contributions right at the beginning, just so I don't forget them. Much of the genetics work we'll talk about today has been done by uh, Bria Hampton, who's a senior graduate student, uh, who's co-mentored between Marty Ferris and myself, uh, and Jake Dillard, who is a, uh, another graduate student in the group uh, working on vaccine work, and then Sharon Tapp-Benz, who's a senior scientist within my group. I'll also be highlighting some work from Ellen uh, Whitmore, uh, Sanjay Sarkar, and Kelsey Knoll, who are former members. So the focus of my group, if you want to distill it down to its core elements, is really to understand what happens when viral pathogens interact with complex populations, and really trying to get at the question of when this happens, why do some individuals develop severe disease or maybe even succumb to infection, while other individuals develop mild disease or maybe asymptomatic infection. We know this is due to a complex interaction uh, between a wide variety of factors, many of which have already been talked about uh, in the earlier talks today, including immune status, microbiome, factors like age. Uh, we're particularly interested in the impact of post genetic variation, and that'll be the focus of my presentation today. But we also have to keep in mind that there are a wide variety of other factors that influence disease outcome, and specifically when thinking about viral pathogens, the virus is a key player in this entire process. Uh, viral strain is very important. We've seen this with the SARS-2 outbreak, that different strains result in different disease manifestations, different levels of transmission, different levels of disease severity. But even factors like route of exposure or viral dose can have a major impact on disease outcome. And this creates several challenges, especially from the standpoint of understanding how genetic variation affects outcome. We have to be able to control for these factors to be able to then increase our power to detect the effects of host genetics. And this is often quite difficult in human populations because all of these factors mask or complicate our ability to detect genetic effects. I like to use the example, um, when my daughter was little, she'd come home from daycare, hop up in my lap, cough in my face, and within two days I'd be done with whatever she gave me. Now, did I get sick because my daughter and I share genetic risk factors for that given pathogen? Or was I sick because I was just worn down and tired, which is what happens when you have small children in the house? Or did she give me such a high dose of virus that she overwhelmed my intrinsic resistance? And even though I might be highly resistant to that given virus, she gave me so much that I scored as susceptible. And so trying to deconvolute those factors is really difficult in populations. Although we've seen a significant increase in our ability to do this work, we also need to have other systems 
both to give us better controlled tools for studying uh, virus viral pathogenesis, and also resources where we can run mechanistic studies to understand uh, at the molecular level how viruses cause disease. Now, since my group is interested in mammalian genetics, we rely very heavily on laboratory mice. Would argue that even though we have exquisite new tools for manipulating uh, genomes across a wide degree, a wide range of species, uh, the mouse is still the premier mammalian genetic system for performing that work. For viral pathogenesis work, it's particularly important. Uh, we can control many of those environmental factors that can complicate our analysis, including uh, viral dose uh, or which viral family. We have exquisite control of host genetics. Uh, recombinant inbred lines have allowed us to uh, perform reproducible experiments or at least use reproducible populations uh, to test uh, the impact of different viruses, different viral strains, genetic studies. Um, we can also uh, manipulate our, the host genome uh, to study the role of specific genes in disease processes while controlling for the rest of the genome. And then there are a wide variety of tools that are available uh, for, for analyzing the host immune response or other aspects of mouse physiology uh, as it relates to the response to viral disease. And so we really view the mouse as a valuable complement uh, to the to answering the questions that we're trying to address in human population. Dr. Heisey? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're um, cutting in and out a little bit. Um, okay. So I'm if you can to, check your mic. I'm going to mute and call in because I think there's some Wi Fi issues here. So I'm just going to mute here. One thing you can also try, Dr. Heisey, is to um, turn off your video. And we can see how that works because that'll free up some bandwidth. So um, let's try that first. And if that doesn't work, then I'll just call in. Um, sorry for the issues here. Um, so we know that mice have been a valuable tool for uh, a variety of uh, addressing a variety of questions in biology. But we also know um, that mice have significant limitations. Uh, very often, because of evolutionary history, differences in physiology, uh, we just can't study in mice uh, what we would want to understand. Um, for many of the studies that we're doing, we try and focus in on aspects of the host response that we know are reasonably well conserved between mice and humans to try and address this issue. But we also realized something else, which is we tend to use one or maybe two mouse strains for most of the work that we do. And in our case, uh, C57 black six are a common strain because most of the gene specific knockouts that we use are on the black six background. However, this also means that we're really studying one genotype in all of our studies. So in essence, we're studying a single genetic uh, background for most of the phenotypes that we're measuring. That background may reflect the situation in some individuals, such as my friend Ralph Barrick, is, but is unlikely to reflect the situation in other individuals, such as Marty Ferris, Alan Whitmore, Lisa Grulinski, or Fernando Pardo Manuel of Vienna, and almost certainly won't reflect the situation in more genetically complex populations. So I would argue that mice not only fail to reproduce what we see in humans because of physiologic and genetic differences between mice and humans, but often because we're trying to extrapolate results from a single genetic background to a much more complex population, uh, we, we often struggle to use the phenotypes and mouse models that are actually relevant uh, to the human populations that we're interested in. And so, this has led us to start to explore uh, different tools that can be used to more effectively model uh, the impact of host genetic diversity on susceptibility to virus-induced disease, uh, and essentially uh, better model uh, what we would expect to see in uh, human populations. Now, this is the point where I always stop the talk and I tell you what I'm not telling you to do is stop using standard inbred strains. Uh, they're incredibly valuable resources. And as I will show you throughout the talk, 
we continue to use individual inbred mouse strains for many of our studies. But what I am going to try and show everybody is that if you're interested in modeling the impact of genetic diversity on the response to any uh, stimulus uh, that you can study in a mouse, uh, there are other systems uh, that you might wanna consider using. And the system we use or predominantly use is a mouse genetic reference population known as the collaborative cross, which was really developed uh, to model uh, genetically complex populations uh, like humans. The collaborative cross uh, is derived from eight uh, inbred laboratory strains, uh, five standard laboratory strains, NOD, NZO, C57 Black 6, 129, and AJ, and three wild-derived inbred strains, WSB, CAST, and PWK. And these three wild-derived strains are particularly important because they introduce most of the genetic diversity into the collaborative cross. Uh, and likewise, much of the phenotypic diversity that we see in which I'll show you in the, uh, today's talk uh, rises from the genetic contributions of these three strains. The geneticists who created the cross, and I had nothing to do with the generation of the cross. I'm solely somebody who uses this resource. Uh, they used a funnel breeding scheme uh, to generate the panel. Uh, so, so they took the eight founder strains, intercrossed them. So at the end of these, this funnel, they now had mice that were a genetic mosaic uh, of those original eight founders. And then importantly, they inbred them. So that at the end of the funnel, they now had a new recombinant inbred mouse strain which is uh, homozygous across uh, 98 to 99% of the genome and therefore genetically reproducible, but also a mosaic of these original eight founder strains. And they repeated this funnel again and again, rearranging the order of the crosses at the top of the funnel to generate a panel of, a, right now there are 64 available uh, collaborative cross strains each of which is a genetic mosaic of those original eight founders, um, yet is also a reproducible mouse strain. So we can go back to each of these strains repeatedly uh, and perform uh, repeat experiments, have uh, replicate animals, and ensure that our studies are appropriately powered. Now, the collaborative cross, again, it's reproducible. Um, the population captures about 90% of the diverse, genetic diversity in the laboratory mouse. And the diversity within the collaborative cross in terms of number of uh, polymorphisms is comparable to the, diver the diversity found in human populations. In fact, it slightly exceeds uh, human genetic diversity. This diversity also drives a wide range of phenotypic variation. Uh, and every phenotype that we or our collaborators have measured in the collaborative cross has been highly diverse uh, across the strains. And we can take advantage of this diversity and the fact that we also know the genetics of each of these strains to readily perform quantitative trait locus or QTL mapping to identify genetic loci that are associated with this phenotypic variation. The cross really should be thought of as multiple different types of resources and related resources. And I'm just showing, showing a few of them here. Uh, the fully inbred strains, which I just described. Uh, so these mice are reproducible. Uh, they're homozygous at essentially every locus across the genome. We can also generate F1 crosses as a second reproducible population. Uh, and we can generate these mice uh, again and again by crossing specific strains. So in this case, crossing CC1, great heterozygous mice. Uh, so again, because these mice are now heterozygous, they better reflect the situation uh, in humans. But we can also tailor these crosses to put specific haplotypes together. For example, in one study, we were interested in fixing uh, the MHC locus so that we could use existing uh, T cell reagents for measuring uh, MHC restricted T cell responses. So we essentially selected one parent to be MACH2B, um, and the other parent was never H2B positive, so that all of the mice were heterozygous for the H2B MHC, allowing us to use existing T cell reagents. We could also use this to create crosses where we're fixing a specific locus within the population that's either high or low response for a given phenotype 
to test whether that locus is really driving uh, the variation in our phenotype of interest. Another population which is related to the collaborative cross is the diversity outbred population. This was derived from the collaborative cross. It's maintained at the Jackson Labs and uh, DO mice can be uh, purchased from the Jackson Labs. These are maintained as an outbred, uh, outbred population. So there's continuous uh, recombination and reassortment of the genome uh, across every generation. Uh, each mouse is genetically distinct, but the haplotype structure of these mice is very, very finely grained. So you can perform high resolution uh, genetic mapping. If you use a sufficient number of mice in your mapping, you can actually map down to uh, single gene resolution. And because uh, these mice are genetically unique, once you've identified that gene, uh, you're limited in what you can do within the diversity outbred population, but because they share the same underlying genetics as the inbred collaborative cross strains, once you have a candidate, you can move back into the collaborative cross to then study the effect of that gene uh, on your phenotype of interest or even across various phenotypes using the reproducible population. So we really view the collaborative cross, the diversity outbred population as complementary uh, resources. Uh, and we've used both um, uh, types of uh, mice for the studies uh, that we've performed in the lab over the past several years. However, today I'm going to focus on work that we've do been doing uh, with the Collaborative Cross for the rest of the talk. So one of the advantages, again, of the Collaborative Cross is the fact that the mice uh, are reproducible. So this allows us to really do uh, comparative studies where we can take identical sets of CC strains, or in this case, we used identical sets of F1 crosses between CC strains and compare the response to three different viral pathogens. Uh, SARS-CoV, uh, or SARS-1, so the original SARS virus, influenza virus, and West Nile virus. And this was all done in collaboration with Ralph Barrick, Michael Gale, Jenny Lund, Fernando Parnemanuel de Vienna. Um, oh no, I'm having a complete blank. Give me a second. Uh, Marty Ferris and uh, Shannon McQueenie. Uh, who are all part of this large-scale collaboration. Uh, decided to use three mice from each cross per time point, uh, eight or nine time points for every virus. So this is a large-scale study comparing the response across time to three different viral pathogens, and also comparing uninfected mice to develop uh, information on baseline phenotypes. And what this study allowed us to do was essentially measure the host response over time within the population. So we could look at inflammatory cell recruitment, changes in antiviral genes, adaptive immunity, viral virus induced disease, and even viral replication across this population. With the goal of one, understanding uh, which host genes are responsible for driving variation in this response, and then asking uh, whether there were any common host genes uh, that were driving susceptibility or resistance uh, to viral pathogens. The other thing we noted very early on, which is gonna be a central focus of today's talk, was that there was tremendous variation prior to infection in most of the immune phenotypes that we were measuring, including uh, lung leukocyte populations, both uh, the normal cells that we would normally expect based on standard inbred strains, such as uh, alveolar macrophages, but also the presence of various inflammatory cell populations, which were highly variable uh, across the population of mice. Uh, and it became clear to us very early on the variation in this baseline immunity was shaping much of the response uh, to the subsequent viral infection. And so I wanna use much of this talk to really, uh, one, use this baseline immunity to illustrate how we can use the collaborative cross, and two, show you some examples of how baseline immune variation uh, can shape subsequent virus-induced disease. So this is one example of one phenotype that we measured which is just variation in monocytic uh, dendritic cells within the lungs of influenza-infected mice. This is a cell population that Tom Brasciali's group had shown was very important in shaping both disease and immune responses uh, to influenza infection. And this is just a subset 
uh, the mice that we studied in this initial screen. And we see high levels of variation. Uh, each line represents the mean of an individual uh, of three to four mice uh, from uh, each uh, F1 cross. Uh, you saw lots of variation uh, post-infection, but as I said, we also noted significant variation prior to infection. And we realized very early on that we had to understand the genetic basis of this pre-existing variation to understand the virus-induced variation. And this was driven home very early on in the process when we had phenotypes that we thought were virus-induced but when we look back at the baseline immune response variation, we realized what we were really measuring was non-virus induced pre-existing variation in immune cell populations in the lungs. And so we decided to focus on that in more detail. This is just showing a few examples of the variation uh, across the collaborative cross. And I've indicated levels in C57 black 6 and BELP-C, two common laboratory strains for immune response studies, uh, just to show where these standard laboratory models fall in comparison uh, to the collaborative cross strains. And we see significant variation. I'll just focus here on plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which are a cell type which is responsible for mounting very rapid uh, antiviral responses uh, in a wide variety of tissues. Uh, we see CC crosses where there are uh, few, if any, detectable PDCs in uninfected lungs, and other strains show very high levels of PDCs within the lungs. Um, and this is true for every phenotype that we measured uh, in terms of immune cell composition within the lungs. And importantly, uh, many of these phenotypes were highly heritable. Uh, with 50% or more of the variation in response uh, being explained by genetic contributions, which for us as people who were interested in genetics uh, was very exciting because it indicated to us that we had a good chance of being able to map uh, the genetic factors that were responsible for this variation. Now, many of you may be familiar with how we perform QTL mapping or how QTL mapping is performed. But uh, for people who are unfamiliar with the process, I like to show this toy diagram, uh, which was uh, developed by Kelsey Knoll, a former graduate student in my group. So essentially, if we have a range of phenotypes, so this is just showing uh, a phenotype for a different virus, uh, chikungunya virus, which causes uh, joint and ankle swelling, uh, we can then perform genome scans to test whether regions of the genome are associated with significant variation uh, in whichever phenotype we're interested in. So in this case, we have this locus at position four, which is associated with an increase in variation. Uh, and what's clear, if we go back to four, is in this case, the presence of the green haplotype is associated with lack of disease, whereas red haplotype would be associated with increased disease uh, at this locus. So what this indicates that in this region of the genome, uh, there is a genetic variant, uh, which is associated with this variation in disease. So we're presuming that there is a polymorphic gene under this locus uh, that is responsible for this variation, and that this is being driven by uh, allelic variation uh, in this gene. And so what we use this approach for is really to identify genetic loci that we're interested in. And then we spend additional time drilling down on those genetic regions to try and identify the specific genes that are responsible for these phenotypes. So again, we can take advantage of the fact that we have all of this information from reproducible populations to then drill down on specific phenotypes or when we identify uh, a locus that's responsible for a specific phenotype, for example, antiviral antibody response, we can ask whether that polymorphic gene is then responsible just for the response to one virus or all of the viruses, or if that locus is also driving variation in a wider range of phenotypes to gain more information on how these genetic variants really affect different stages in the immune response, immune cell development, or virus-induced disease. 
So just an ex example, I'm going to walk through um, really from the beginning to end how we go through uh, the process of identifying genes uh, and testing whether a, a candidate gene is really responsible for our phenotype of interest. So this is work again from Bria Hampton. This is actually a study she started when she first joined the lab uh, about four and a half years ago. Uh, she actually defends her thesis next week, uh, where she measured uh, just baseline variation in total IgG1 within the serum. Uh, she mapped a locus on chromosome 18 that's associated with this variation where the presence of three haplotypes, uh, purple is WSB, green is cast, and gray is C57 black 6, were associated with high levels of IgG1 in the serum, uh, and the other haplotypes were associated with either neutral or low levels of IgG1 in the serum. She then asked whether this locus was specific uh, to IgG1, um, or whether it was more broadly associated with variation in uh, antibody levels. Uh, she found that the locus, uh, in fact, broadly affects total IgG, um, as well as uh, IgM within the serum, uh, as well as other uh, Ig subtypes. Importantly, remember again, we had phenotypic data from these same mouse strains for a variety of viruses across a number of different phenotypes. Therefore, we could ask whether this locus was, was initially identified uh, as regulating variation in total serum IgG levels, also had an effect on antigen-specific antibody levels. Uh, and so we measured uh, its effects on total uh, SARS-CoV-specific antibody, both IgM and IgG, uh, as well as influenza-specific uh, antibody responses. And what we found was that the presence of one or two copies of the high response haplotype. Uh, so black six, cast or WSB, which was associated with high levels of total antibody was actually associated with less robust levels of antigen specific antibody. So this uh, for both SARS and influenza. So this suggested that this locus was affecting both total levels of antibody as well as uh, antigen specific responses. And because it was having a broad effect on antigen specific antibody responses, uh, Bria probed uh, the locus in more detail to try and identify uh, the specific candidate gene that was involved in this uh, driving this phenotype. And to do this, we take advantage of a number of bioinformatics and based approaches, including uh, we can take advantage of the fact because we know the haplotype effects uh, that are driving this phenotype, uh, we can look at whether there are specific polymorphisms in either the high or low response haplotypes that are specifically associated uh, with different phenotypic outcomes. So in this case, Bria looked for polymorphisms within genes under the locus that were specific, either shared between the three high response haplotypes or unique, but found, or unique variants that were found uh, just within each of the three high response haplotypes. And she found one gene under the locus, MBD1, that had these characteristics where there were unique polymorphisms that were specific uh, to the high response haplotypes and not shared uh, with the other five haplotypes, making MBD1 her best candidate. Uh, this was further driven home by the fact that because we're measuring variation in antibody response, uh, uh, she was particularly interested in the fact that expression is upregulated in activated B cells. Now, MBD1 is a transcriptional repressor, uh, so it's a methyl CPG binding uh, domain protein. Um, and so she wanted to determine whether MBD1 was involved in uh, really driving variation in either antibody response or B cell development. Uh, to do this, we use a couple of different approaches. Uh, we can either knock the gene out, uh, which is a dramatic effect uh, on the uh, locus, or we can actually swap uh, the higher low response haplotypes using CRISPR-Cas gene editing uh, between mouse strains. Um, I'm going to show you data from the knockout right now. We're still, we have the allele swap mice. Uh, we're still process of phenotyping them. So unfortunately that data isn't available yet. But what we found was that when we knock out MBD1, 
uh, we see a significant effect on the IgG1 levels in the knockout compared to wild type mice. And then Bria extended this work to look at B cell development, uh, and she found specific effects on both marginal zone B cells and antibody secreting cells within the spleen. Uh, and they were contrasting where the knockout resulted in an increase in marginal zone B cells, both in total number and the percentage within the spleen, and a decrease in uh, the levels of antibody secreting cells within the spleen, which is consistent with the effects on IgG1 levels that we're seeing. Now, we're still in the process of working out exactly how MBD1 is affecting antibody response. We're evaluating effects of MBD1 on gene expression uh, or repression in B cell populations. We're also looking at the effects of MBD1 on B cell development, uh, as, well or, as well as other aspects of the immune response. Uh, as I said, we've generated an allele swap for this gene, so we can actually test whether high or low response alleles in this gene are affecting B cell differentiation or gene expression. And then we're looking at more detail on how this gene affects uh, antigen-specific responses as well. So again, this is just one example of how we can take this, uh, use this population to measure phenotypic variation and really start to drill down on the role of specific genes and how they affect virus-induced disease. Now, the other thing I told you at the beginning is that we need to account for this genetic variation in baseline immune response to really start to understand uh, what drives variation in virus-induced responses. And uh, I wanna show you a couple of ways that we're doing this. And this is important uh, both for understanding uh, how pre-existing state affects virus-induced responses, but I hope it also illustrates how we can start to use some of the data sets that we're generating through this resource to really limit the number of animals that we then use in subsequent studies. Because we, once we have a data set, we can then begin to cross-analyze uh, the genetic effects uh, for how does baseline immune variation affect the response to various viruses or other phenotypes. And so one of the goals with this resource is really to generate large-scale data sets where we can continually go back to those data sets and really gain new insights uh, while limiting the number of new experiments that we have to perform, or at least limiting the number of experiments that we perform to more confirmatory uh, follow-up studies. So as part of this work, I showed you one example uh, with serum uh, antibody variation. We've also mapped QTL associated with a wide variety of lung leukocyte populations as well as systemic immune populations. And we can use this analysis then to ask, how do QTL that regulate these baseline uh, responses affect the susceptibility to virus-induced disease? And so this is another example from work that Bria has done. This is looking at variation in alveolar macrophages within the lungs of uninfected uh, CC mice. Bria mapped a QTL on chromosome nine, where the uh, haplotype is um, driven by the uh, dark blue or NOD uh, response. Is, uh, haplotype is associated with high response. Every, uh, the other seven haplotypes are associated with low response. Uh, the strongest candidate gene under this um, uh, uh, locus is a gene that's involved in end endosomal transport. Uh, and so we haven't validated that gene is uh, actually driving the phenotype, uh, but those studies are underway. What Bria decided to do as a follow-up was ask, does the presence of high or low response haplotypes under this locus associate with uh, virus-induced disease phenotypes? And so what she did was she took all of the disease and immune phenotypes that we've measured for influenza, SARS-CoV, West Nile virus, and uh, the other viruses that we've looked at, and started asking within the collaborative cross, is there an association of this locus with variation in any of those phenotypes? Now, these are just associations. This just tells us that there's a potential genetic effect uh, perturbing uh, the phenotypic variation uh, in these other stimuli. Uh, and what it tells us is that we then need to go in if we're interested in that variation and perform additional follow-up studies. And 
But when we've done this, we do see some really intriguing associations. So this locus that's regulating uh, alveolar macrophages is also associated with uh, denuded airways following influenza infection. Uh, the uh, time of peak uh, weight loss or disease uh, following influenza induced uh, disease. And this would be consistent with what we already know about the important role that alveolar macrophages play uh, in regulating homeostasis within the lungs, either in the unperturbed or in the context of virus induced disease states. And this is just a couple of examples of specific loci regulating specific phenotypes uh, and their association with variation in virus-induced disease states. And this is just a subset of the uh, virus-induced disease states for influenza that we've looked at. But we see significant associations between several of these loci, including loci regulating baseline numbers of CD4 or CD8 T cells within the lungs uh, and, virus, and influenza virus-induced disease. We've also extended this work uh, to uh, coronaviruses. Um, so we initially did the work with SARS-CoV-1. Um, and for the rest of the talk, um, I'm gonna use that SARS-CoV-1 analysis as a jumping off point uh, to focus on SARS-CoV-2, since that's of course highly relevant uh, for, how we, uh, for what we've been dealing with over the last couple of years. So Bria had identified QTL that were associated with uh, uh, monocyte populations within the lungs. Uh, QI87 is a regulator of inflammatory monocytes uh, within the lungs of uninfected mice. Uh, QIH8, uh, which is on uh, chromosome 15, also regulates this population. Uh, in combination, these two loci explain about 70% of the variation uh, in inflammatory monocytes uh, in the lungs. Uh, the, 70% of the genetically driven variation uh, inflammatory monocytes within the lungs of uninfected mice. Importantly, QAH8 also contributes to variation in PDCs. These are these innate immune uh, responders that uh, drive very rapid uh, type one interferon responses following viral infection. Bria showed that QAH7 had a strong association with SARS-CoV-1 susceptibility across a wide range of phenotypes. I'm just showing a couple of these phenotypes. These, this is viral titer in the lungs at days two or four post-infection, where the presence of high response haplotypes, which were associated with high levels or increased numbers of inflammatory monocytes in the lungs, were associated with higher viral titers uh, in the lungs upon SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this suggested this locus was associated with increased susceptibility uh, to SARS-CoV-1 and D disease. And this was actually consistent with what was already known in the literature is that inflammatory monocytes are actually a driver of SARS-CoV-1 induced pathogenesis within the lungs. This was work from Stan Perlman's group from a few years ago. When SARS-2 emerged, we were interested in testing whether these same loci were associated with uh, regulation of SARS-CoV-2 induced disease. And so to do this, uh, we actually tested, used an F2 cross strategy where we took one mouse strain, which had a low response haplotype at both QH7 and QH8. So this strain has reduced numbers of inflammatory monocytes in the lungs and also in, uh, PDCs within the lungs. But our focus of the study was really on inflammatory monocytes. Uh, we crossed that strain with CC37, uh, which has high response haplotypes of both QH7 and QH8. So this strain has increased numbers of both uh, inflammatory monocytes and PDCs in the lung that are driven by the high response haplotype uh, at uh, both QH7 and QH8. We intercross these mice uh, to create an F2 population, which is reassorted across the genome and then challenge these mice with a mouse adapted strain of SARS-CoV-2 that was generated by Ralph Barrick's group to really test where the presence of high or low response haplotypes at either of these loci was associated with increased susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. 
Now, what we found looking first at QAH7s, so just to remind you, this is the locus that is specifically associated with um, regulation of inflammatory monocytes. Uh, we did see a weak association between the high response haplotypes, so more inflammatory monocytes, and increased weight loss during SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this suggested that uh, we were seeing an association, although it didn't reach significance. We did see a significant association with QIH8, where the presence of the high response haplotype resulted in increased uh, resistance to SARS-CoV-1. So here I need to pause because this is actually the opposite of what we would have predicted. If inflammatory monocytes were driving disease, we would have predicted that the BB haplotype would have had lower body weights, more severe disease. So although we saw a significant association, what we instead are seeing is that the BB haplotype, the high response haplotype under this locus is associated with increased resistance. So this made us start to rethink our hypothesis about whether we were really measuring uh, an effect of inflammatory monocyte genetic regulation versus a different phenotype such as PDCs. And this is uh, just showing further evidence from that study. Importantly, we failed to remap the effect of the QA7 uh, haplotype. We mapped a new locus on chromosome nine, but we also importantly remapped the locus uh, QAH8 within this population. Uh, so confirming uh, the effect of QAH8 on SARS-CoV-2 induced disease. And again, this was associated with increased resistance to virus-induced disease. And so this made us start to think that we might have been looking at the wrong cell type when we started this process. And we needed to think more about the effect of PDCs on virus-induced disease. So we again took advantage of an existing data set. This was data on uh, susceptibility of a panel of 40 CC strains uh, to SARS-CoV-2 induced disease. And we retested the effect of the haplotypes at QH7 or QH8, uh, as well as two additional haplotypes, QH9 and QH10, that were associated specifically with regulation of PDC numbers uh, for an association with virus-induced disease. Um, we did see some other associations, such as the CD4 T cell locus. Uh, we failed to see an association with the inflammatory monocyte loci that we originally mapped. Um, but we did see some associations or at least suggestive associations uh, between the other two PDC uh, loci uh, and susceptibility to virus-induced disease where the presence of a locus that's driving high numbers of PDCs in the lungs is associated with resistance to SARS-CoV-2. And this is just showing some of that data where the high response haplotypes are associated with increased resistance uh, to SARS-CoV-2 compared to low response haplotypes. So this again suggested that PDCs may be driving susceptibility or resistance to virus-induced disease and genetic regulators of PDCs may be important in determining susceptibility to virus-induced disease. We're in the process of performing additional validation studies. Uh, this is just showing some of the work that we've done uh, where we're actually depleting PDCs. In this case, we're just doing initial work in BELP-C strains. Um, and so what we see is that isotype controlled mice, uh, when infected with SARS-CoV, they develop uh, mild disease. Uh, so uh, on a five point scale, uh, one to two is mild to moderate uh, hair ruffling. Uh, and uh, three, we're seeing uh, moderate disease signs, including uh, enhanced uh, breathing rates. Uh, and when we get to a score of four, we're really moving into mice being morbid and reaching our humane endpoint where they need to be euthanized. And anti-PDC antibody treatment resulted in more severe disease and enhanced viral titers within these mice. So we still have some additional work to do to really prove that these loci are regulating PDCs and also SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. And we're still in the process of trying to resolve the specific genes that are driving this. But again, uh, I hope what this shows is kind of our ability to move from understanding baseline variation uh, and genetically driven variation in immune cell populations and how that can then be used to predict 
or understand uh, how that pre-existing uh, variation can affect uh, various uh, subsequent environmental responses, including virus-induced disease. Again, we're also using this data to start to uh, try and limit how many mice we need to use for follow-up studies, because again, these existing data sets can be used to ask how a wide variety of stimuli affect responses in the collaborative cross and what the effect of genetic variation is on these responses. Although, we, as I showed, we do have to do follow-up validation studies to really prove that what we see in these initial associations uh, is real, and then two, to begin to understand uh, the um, genetic basis of that variation. So in the last few minutes, uh, before we open up this up to questions, I wanna show you one more set of studies. I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly. Uh, and this really shows a different type of analysis that we can do, which is really using these sorts of resources to understand how, uh, what regulates the response uh, to vaccine-induced immunity. Uh, so again, I'm gonna stick with the theme of SARS-CoV-2 because it's work that a lot of different groups have been focusing on. And we really wanna understand the factors that affect vaccine efficacy and failure. Uh, again, highly relevant as we think about the effectiveness of existing SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and how we can make them more effective. And we wanted to look at a number of variables that we knew could affect outcome. Uh, age is quite important. Uh, so like humans, older mice show enhanced susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2, uh, at least mouse adapted strains of SARS-CoV-2. So they, they also show immune senescence, so they mount less robust immune responses. Uh, so we can study the effect of age. Uh, we can study the effect of various adjuvants on the efficacy or safety of the vaccine. Uh, we have a panel of SARS and SARS-like viral variants uh, that we can use to study the effect of virus genetic variation on efficacy. And we can also study the impact of host genetics on variation in these responses. And I just wanna quickly show you um, how these systems are working. Um, we're using an inactivated vaccine for our studies. So inactivated vaccines have been used extensively, particularly in Asia um, for uh, protecting against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they have many advantages. Uh, they're low cost. They're relatively uh, fast to produce. They've shown good efficacy against the original strains of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they show reduced potency and efficacy against new variants. Um, this is true for many of the vaccines, but it's particularly true for the inactivated vaccines. And there was some concern when we started these studies because early preclinical studies with other inactivated coronavirus vaccines it suggested that they could be associated with vaccine failure and actually enhance pathology within the lungs. And so that's one of the things we wanted to understand. Uh, just briefly, uh, we measure uh, virus in, or vaccine induced neutralizing antibody levels. Uh, we see uh, robust responses, especially in young mice. They're somewhat reduced, but still detectable uh, in the aged mice. So we are seeing uh, some effect of uh, the uh, aging and immune senescence in terms of the uh, levels and magnitude of vaccine-induced immunity. Um, the vaccines protect really well against homologous challenge, especially in young mice. So this is just comparing the inactivated vaccine uh, with several different adjuvants. I'll focus on alum, which is used in many um, human vaccines, including several of the inactivated uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, in RIBI, which is an experimental adjuvant that drives a strong Th1 immune response, whereas alum is more associated with a Th2 or more uh, allergy-like um, uh, immune response. Uh, we see that these adjuvants all work well. Uh, they protect uh, young animals, uh, even when the vaccine is given without adjuvant, uh, compared to control groups where we see uh, more severe disease. And occasionally, uh, animals that reach our humane endpoints end and have to be euthanized. Uh, age does impact vaccine efficacy. Uh, we see reduced protection in terms of body weight compared to controls, uh, but we still see reasonably robust efficacy with homologous challenge uh, where we're not developing the severe disease signs uh, that are seen in the 
when we uh, look at other phenotypes such as viral titer, we're protecting with vaccine against viral replication in the lungs and young animals. Uh, slightly less protection in the old animals, but still robust protection compared to unvaccinated controls. So uh, this is very consistent with the performance profile uh, that's seen in human populations. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over uh, a couple of these slides. Uh, we see less robust protection when we start looking at variants of concern. Uh, this is uh, uh, a mouse adapted uh, B1351 or beta variant. So one of the early variants that arose in the outbreak. Uh, we see uh, robust protection in young mice, uh, significantly reduced protection in aged mice with the variant, which is consistent again with what we expect with vaccine breakthrough. Uh, we also see less robust protection uh, from lung pathology uh, with the variant, especially in the alum adjuvanted group uh, compared to the ribby uh, adjuvanted group um, in the young mice. Uh, in old mice, we see much more splay, which is consistent with uh, the range and variation uh, in susceptibility that we see in aged animals. Now, just to finish up a couple of key points, um, one of the things that we're concerned about is as the virus con continues to evolve in its ability to evade immunity, will we start to see viruses that cause more severe disease uh, in vaccinated individuals? Um, and are there ways that we can prevent those outcomes? Or what happens if we see a completely novel uh, SARS-like virus emerge? And so to test this, we evaluated another SARS-like virus, SHC014, which is a pre-emergent SARS-1-like virus, um, which replicates uh, in mice, but doesn't cause disease. And that's shown here. And we tested, uh, the efficacy of either the alum or ribby adjuvanted vaccines in protecting against SHC014. Uh, and what we found was that uh, the ribby adjuvant performed uh, fairly well. Uh, we saw um, no changes in respiratory function, uh, no alterations in pathology. More concerning was the alum adjuvant actually resulted in enhanced pulmonary pathology compared to uh, unvaccinated mice, uh, enhanced levels of airway uh, restriction uh, as measured by unrestricted uh, plethysmography, um, including uh, 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 index indices of constriction with suggesting uh, less efficient uh, respiratory function. And we also see a delay in viral clearance in the, in the alum adjuvant vaccinated group, suggesting that the presence of alum adjuvant may be skewing the immune response uh, to drive enhanced pathology and less efficient clearance uh, in the face of a true uh, breakthrough infection. So this is raising from fla some flags for us in terms of which adjuvant choice should be used uh, when using these inactivated vaccines. Uh, and it's an area that we're actively investigating. Uh, and this is just further uh, evaluation of some of the pathology. We're seeing increased levels of eosinophils uh, when we use alum adjuvants with all of these vaccines, which is another sign of enhanced uh, allergic inflammatory responses in the lungs, uh, which is something that we would like to avoid. Now, just the last bit of data I'll show, because the goal here was to talk about genetics, is we wanted to know if we could ask what is the effect on genetics, on vaccine safety and efficacy? Uh, we've done a lot of work with the collaborative cross with influenza vaccines. Ralph Group, Ralph Group is also doing work with SARS-CoV vaccines. And we've started looking at SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in the collaborative cross. And just a bit of data uh, with homologous challenge where we see CC strains such as CC61 and CC84, which show us exactly what we would expect based on our standard inbred strains. And that compared to no vaccine where the mice lose significant body weight, uh, the inactivated vaccine with either adjuvant or no adjuvant at all is protective. We also have strains where we see variation in adjuvant response. In this case, the alum adjuvant induces a more protective response compared to ribby or no adjuvant alone. Other strains where ribby appears to induce more robust protection than alum 
uh, adjuvant in vaccines compared to either no vaccine or no adjuvant. And then CC strains where we don't appear to see any protection or at least limited protection uh, against virus-induced challenge. So we're in the process of performing a much, much larger scale screen uh, to begin to map the genetic loci that regulate this variation in response. Uh, unfortunately, we're probably about a year away from having any useful data uh, from that screen. So just to conclude, factors such as age, vaccine and adjuvant formulation, host genetics, as well as heterologous viral challenge, all contribute to breakthroughs. So I think none of that is too surprising. Uh, but now we can begin to actually uh, deconvolute that specific mechanisms uh, that are driving these responses. Uh, we do want to caution about alum-based adjuvants with these vaccines because they do appear to um, uh, cause problems, at least in the face of uh, heterologous challenge. And so this is something that bears uh, further investigation and may lead to the need to reformulate adjuvants uh, for these types of vaccines, at least against uh, coronaviruses. But again, this requires additional uh, investigation. And with that, I want to stop. Uh, thank everybody for your attention uh, and just end by again acknowledging some of the key contributors. I acknowledged Bria. Uh, uh, Jake Dillard did all of the vaccine work along with Sharon Taft Benz, Tori Baxter, Liz Anderson, and Katia Pressey. Uh, Marty Ferris has been involved in doing all of our genetic and statistical analysis. There's a cast of many more geneticists that all contribute to this work. All of it's in collaboration with Ralph Barrick, and we've been, received incredibly generous support from NIH uh, to drive uh, the entire collaborative cross enterprise forward. And with that, I will stop and take any questions in the couple of minutes that I have left. And I apologize for running a little long. <laughs>